And as you can see, I'm going to speak this morning on remove those burial clothes. Remove those burial clothes. Have you all got a little bulletin? Who, who hasn't got a bulletin and needs one? Can I just have a... Uh, you can just raise your hand if you haven't got one. We've got some notes in there. You can make notes of my sermon if you like. We've also got the website where you can download and listen to the sermon if you missed one or two of the, th- of the, of the important aspects of a sermon, of the sermon. So enjoy it with us. Now, everybody sitting here this morning had to get dressed, thankfully. Am I right? You had to get dressed this morning. It takes time to get dressed for some of us. Some of us has to choose what they're going to wear. They go into this cupboard and they take out the whole cupboard and they can't make a choice which, what, what they're going to wear. And uh, some women are like, or some wives are like that, they will ask the husband, what do you think? He will say, wear that. So he says, oh, I'm going to wear this then. It always goes against the grain of what the husband says. Some of us wear, in certain times, clothes of our sports, uh, the teams that we support in sport. Uh, we get people that wear the Stormers jersey. Very holy persons or people. They know what they're talking about. You can trust them. And then you get people that wear the Blue Bull jersey. Uh, we pray for you guys. Don't worry. We know that you, you're struggling. You're going through a time in your life that you don't know what's right from wrong. But you'll get there. Don't worry. But some of us, spiritually, we also wear clothes. And unfortunately, there are still people out there, Christian people, that are still wearing burial clothes. They haven't taken the time to get those burial clothes loosened and got getting rid of those burial clothes. So let's read about this this morning. So if you opened your Bibles in John 11.38, I'm going to read from the God's Word translation. You can just follow in whichever translation you have with you. Deeply moved, again, Jesus went to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone, with a stone covering the entrance. Jesus said, Take the stone away. Martha, the dead man's sister, told Jesus, Lord, there must already be a stench. It has been dead for four days. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see God's glory? So the stone was moved away from the entrance of the tomb. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I've known that you always hear me. However, I've said this so that the crowd standing around me will believe that you sent me. And Jesus had said this, after Jesus had said this, he shouted as loudly as he could, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, strips of clothes, Cloth were wound around his feet and hands, and his face was wrapped with a handkerchief. Jesus told him, told, told them, free Lazarus and let him go. Let's close our eyes in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise and we worship you for having the opportunity this morning to be in your presence. Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is present with us this morning and that is the, the Holy Spirit has already in, infiltrated each and every single person's heart and soul and mind. I ask that, you will, that every mind will be captured to the message of your word this morning, that they will listen and that they will hear as well what you are saying through me this morning. Therefore, Lord, I give myself over to you. I open myself over to you and I ask that your word will be will be given through me, me as a vessel of your word being given to this congregation this morning. I ask that those who need to hear this word this morning will hear it, and that it will fall on soil that is ready to receive your word, and that it will grow, Lord. I also ask that you will give, that the authority be given us to this morning, that every demonic force that comes against this word of you will be cast out of this place in Jesus' name. Satan, you have no right in this place this morning. This is God's place. And we command you and your demons to live in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 
So in this scripture of the Bible, we find that Lazarus was dead. I presume all of you know the story of Lazarus. That is the only reason I think that anybody will be in a tomb in burial clothes. I cannot think of any other legal reason for anybody to be in a tomb in burial clothes. So we can deduce from the scripture that Lazarus was indeed a dead man. He was dead. The same can be said of our spiritual condition as well. There should be no reason for you as a Christian to be dressed in burial clothes and behind a, in, in a tomb behind a rock. If you're a Christian, there should be no reason for that. The question is, if you, are, if you are wearing burial clothes this morning, how are you going to get rid of those burial clothes? What are you going to do? If there's people that you know that is dressed in burial clothes, and we know people like that, we see them every day. We see people who are still dead, that hasn't even been raised up from their dead sin. They are still there. How do we deal with that? What do we do? Now before we, we, we get to that, I want to uh, give you some, some historical facts first. Now, about the burial preparation first, so that you understand the context in what we're going to do this morning. The Hebrews didn't practice embalming in the way other cultures had, such as the Egyptians practiced it. They did it different. In ancient time, it was a tradition when somebody died to take the body and to put spices and aromatic ointment on the dead body to help remove unpleasant odors. That's what they did with that body. The body would then be wrapped in linen strips and of various sizes and widths. We, we see this in John 19.40 where, where we speak about Jesus. It says, These two men took the body of Jesus and bound it with strips of linen. They laced the strips with spices. This was the Jewish custom for burial then usually the body would be covered with a burial garment. That they will, put, they, they will wrap him in that garment. Therefore, when a dead body was, or dead person was wrapped in those linen and that garment, usually the feet and the hands were also wrapped in that linen. So they couldn't, if they ever came alive, they, they wouldn't be able to move those hands and that, those feet. You can think of a mummy. If you've seen a mummy, a picture of a mummy, usually they have that picture where it, where it is bound. We also see that after Jesus died, a, name, a man named Joseph requested permission, and he said he wanted to prepare Jesus' body just the way the Jews have the custom of preparing for burial. And that is using myrrh and aloes and spices and linen bandaging, if you go into the, into the historic facts. Now, after the burial... After that man was, or that woman was placed into the tomb, that tomb was visited for three days by the family and the friends because they wanted to make sure that he was actually dead. Because it, it did happen that at times that person was thought to be dead and he came alive. And only after three days they will go into the tomb again and they will put some oils, the, family, the, the woman in the family would put, put some oils and some spices on the body. Because they wanted to, in at the first place, try to curb the smell that was, that was emanating from this body. Uh, and also as a, as a token of respect for this, for this dead person. Now. But we see, we, we see evidence of this in, in Lazarus and in Jesus when Jesus was buried. Let's see this morning. Now that's background. Let's see this morning what is needed for you as a Christian who is unbound, who is alive, to assist somebody that is still bound in sin. The first verse of Scripture is verse 39 that we've read. It says... Martha, the dead man's sister, told Jesus, Lord, there must already be a stench. He's been dead for four days. What do we see here? 
she knew that he's going to smell because he's dead. Therefore, as a Christian, you must be able to smell death. You must be able to smell sin, to know when something is wrong. If we read the preceding verses, we find that Jesus knew that Lazarus was on his deathbed. You will read there. They, 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 they send the messenger to Christ and say, Lazarus, your friend is dying. And then it says Jesus decided to stay another two days, knowing that his friend is going to die. And he said he did it so that God's glory will be manifested. Jesus said that. He stayed there so that his glory or God's glory can be manifested through what he's going to do. He knew that Lazarus was physically dead and in the tomb when he, ar uh, when he arrived at the tomb. He knew it. Nonetheless, he requested that the tomb be opened. And Lazarus has already been in that grave for four days. And it's a fact that, especially in that area where they lived, it's extremely hot. So a, a dead person or a dead animal will, 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 will start to decompose so much quicker. Well, it, it's terrible. And now Martha knew this, and therefore she says to Jesus that if they're going to open this, there would be a stench. It's going to stink. It's also very probable that the tomb was already opened the previous day. Remember, that was the third day. And they had to put the oils and the spices and everything on that body. So she knew that something wasn't right. She knew that there's going to be something not smelling nice. But it is obvious that, did not have a, the, 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 that the spices and the oils, therefore, did not have the desired effect of curbing the stench. Because that's what, what one of the reasons they did it, but it didn't work. They put all these perfumes and everything on the dead body and it still stinks. Didn't help. Didn't help. So let's just go medically and, and look at why a dead body stinks. Why does a dead body stink? When something dies, there are chemicals that get produced during the decomposition of proteins. And proteins is what? It's your muscles, your fibers, anything that's alive, that can be used, anything protein-like. These chemicals are responsible for the rotting smell you get in dead animals and people. And it's extremely, extremely difficult to curb the smell. It's very difficult to smell. The, have, you, have you ever smelled a dead dog? <laughs> it's terrible. Am I right? Even from a mile away, you can still smell it. It just travels because of that. And no oils and no perfumes, nothing can make that smell go away. You have to bury it very deep to make sure it doesn't come through the ground. Now, spiritual, some people are spiritual dead and they are stinking of dead, of sin. They are stinking of sin. When we are spiritual dead, we also stink because of sin. That's a fact. We are decomposing spiritually anything that could have been used for god's glory is being broken down bit by bit when you die when you are dead in sin to such an extent that you are not able to use any of that parts anymore because it's gone it's decomposed and when we decompose spiritually it also stinks that is why god can't be close to sinners doesn't want to come close to a sinner because it's a stink for him to, get to come close to that sinner. Sin stinks. That's the truth. But you know what's interesting? The dead cannot smell the stench of sin. The dead cannot smell the stench of sin. Only the living can smell the stench of sin. Therefore, today I'm telling you, if you not, cannot smell the stench of sin, that means one thing. You are dead. You are dead in sin. If the smell of, of sin doesn't bother you, something is wrong. 
Something is terribly wrong. It means you are dead because you cannot smell it. If you are with people or surrounded by people who does sinful things and it doesn't bother you, something is wrong. That stench is not bothering you. If a guy uses the name of the Lord in vain and it doesn't bother you, something is wrong. You are dead. That's the first thing you must realize. If sin doesn't bother you, you are dead. And you've got a problem. When we do not recognize the stench of sin, we refuse to obey God. We get this. Paul writes this in Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 3. He says, You were once dead because of your failures and sins. You followed the ways of this present world and its spiritual ruler. This ruler continues to work in people who refuse to obey God. All of us once lived among these people and followed the desires of our corrupt nature. We did what our corrupt desires and thought wanted us to do. So because of our nature, we deserve God's anger just like everyone else. When you cannot smell the dead, when you cannot smell sin, it means that you are already dead, dead in sin. It says there, you are dead, you do, you're not obeying God. Now, Satan will try and mask the sin of smell, or the, the smell of, of, of death or of sin. Make no mistake. He's going to use all these perfumes and oils to try to, to make you not smell it. The problem with, 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 with sin is, sin is inviting. Am I right? Sin is usually inviting. It looks nice. doesn't look as if it's going to stink. <laughs> it's going to look nice. He will try to make it seem like nothing is wrong. Nothing is wrong by doing it or participating in the sinful act. Don't worry, it's not that bad. Just do it. Nobody's going to worry. Have you noticed that sin usually seems to be inviting? It doesn't repel you. In fact, it attracts you. I'm a bit far now. Makes me think, have you seen that plant that attracts the insects, that eats insects? Yeah. They look inviting. They smell nice to that insect. Yeah. He wants to be there. But the moment he falls onto that plant, he walks on that plant, he's dead. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He uses sin like those plants. He wants to attract us. Makes it look invi inviting. It, it smells nice for those who are dead. Because they cannot smell, remember? They cannot smell the sin. Because they are dead. But when we receive the ability to smell sin, no amount of masking will keep you from smelling the stench of sin. When you become alive, it doesn't matter what the devil does. It doesn't matter what he does to curb or to try to get that smell of that sin. You will know that something is wrong. You will know that beneath those oils and those perfumes, something is off, something is rotting, something is dead. Satan cannot hide the smell of sin where there is people in the vicinity who have been made alive in Jesus Christ. And Satan knows it. That's why he doesn't want you to go to people that's in sin. He doesn't want you to frequent people that's living in sin, that's dead. Because he knows that maybe, just maybe, you will stand in front of that tomb and you will say, Get out in the name of Jesus. Get free. That's why He will stop you from getting to those places. He will, you, he will get excuses for you not to visit those places. But we are called to go to where the sinners are. We are called to go to where people are buried in the tombs. But instead we decide, and we're going to get to that. Instead we decide to stand outside the tomb and look on to the dead people. The living, did you know the living also has a smell? Those who have been made alive in Jesus Christ also has a smell. And the dead don't like that. Satan don't like that smell. 
We see in 2 Corinthians 2.15. It's a nice scripture. It says, To God we are the aroma of Christ among those who are saved and among those who are dying. To some people we are a deadly fragrance. To Satan you are a deadly fragrance if you have been made alive in Jesus Christ. While to others we are a life-giving fragrance. When you are alive in Jesus Christ and you stand before that tomb, the, the dead can't smell the other dead, but they're going to smell you. They're going to smell there's life here. There's a life-giving power of Jesus Christ coming through you into that tomb. And they're going to start to, to realize something is wrong. Something isn't right here. There's something here. But you know what? We must never underestimate Satan. He's not stupid. He's not stupid. And unfortunately, people do underestimate him. They think he's stupid. If Satan cannot get the entire body, he's going to try to get a part of your body to die. He's going to try to get a part of your body to die. In medical terms, we call it gangrene. Gangrene. Gangrene is when it's a localized death and decomposition of body tissue resulting from obstructed circulation or bacterial infection. The devil knows that if, if he is able to infect a part of your life, if he is able to, to let a part of your life die, then it is possible for him to also infect the other parts of your life. That is why it is extremely, extremely, extremely important that you give everything over to Christ. If you only give part of your life to Christ, there is still the possibility that that other part can be infected and can die. And when that part dies, it can have an effect on the other parts of your life. If you do not give your, your work life to Christ... You are going to walk in the ways of the world. That part is going to be dead. There's no life-giving part, life-giving from Christ there. He's not giving His blood, His life to that part because you do not want Christ there. And when you are there, that part can influence your church life, your spiritual life, your family life. But when you give everything to Christ, everything is alive. Nothing is dead. When you give your life to to Christ and you say I want to have that life giving power of you in me nothing is going to be dead and it's going to infiltrate every single part of your life but that's a choice you have to make that's a choice you have to make you must decide to give your whole life and your whole life to Christ let's read what you need to do if a part of your life is not for Christ and is dead and Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 5, 29. It says, So if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose part of your body than it, to have all of it thrown into hell. And if your right hand leads you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, it is better for you to lose a part of your body than to have all of it go into hell. If a part of your life is infected by gangrene, cut it off. Cut it off. Let it go. Throw it into the fire. If there's something in your life that's not right, cut it off. If you have friends that continues to, in, to influence you in sinning, cut them off. They are going to influence the rest of your body. I'm not saying... I'm not saying forget them. I say cut that part of your life off. You have to work as a life-giving partner with Christ in situations like that. Because they are in tombs. And they need to be, get to, to, be, to be brought out of those tombs. That is your job there. That's the first part. So the first part is we need to, re, to, to, to smell sin. Let's look at the second scripture. Let me just see why this is not working now. You need to believe. Not only the person, and listen to this, this is important. 
This is not only the person who is in the grave that needs to believe. Who was Jesus speaking to? He was speaking to the crowd. He told them, He said to them, You need to believe in order for my glory to be manifest in this place. And that's exactly what we need to understand here. He was speaking to the crowd surrounding the, to the tomb. He wasn't speaking to the dead person there. He was speaking to those who were alive. He was telling them to believe in order to see, instead of to see in order to believe. How many of us would rather, would only believe when we see? We like Thomas. We want, we want to see something happening. I want to see the Lord working in you, and then I'll believe. Only when you believe are you going to be able to see. That's the rule. Many times we are like Martha. We want to see God's glory before we believe. We say that we believe that God can bring the spiritual dead to life. But then we stand, stand back and we wait. We wait in disbelief. We wait to see what God can do and then only then will we take the next step of believing. God has called us to make disciples. God has called us to get those who are dead in sin come alive. That's our job. He called us to stand at the grave of the spiritually dead and to believe that He can bring them back to life. How many times have we looked upon a spiritual dead person and thought to ourselves, you know what, that person is too far off. He's too a bad a sinner. He's been long, too long he's been dead. There's no hope for him. There's no hope. And I've been one of those people. And you know what, I've seen miracles where my disbelief caused that man to, to, to linger longer in the world where somebody else who had the belief that I lacked, come in, and that, that person's life was changed completely, and I was standing in disbelief, because I couldn't believe that that man made that choice. Because when, when, when I saw him, he was the worst sinner on this earth. And I can say to God this morning as well, thank you for saving me, because I was there as well. I was a bad sinner myself. But you know what? I've been made alive People are still talking to me in disbelief when they see what I'm doing now. Saying, we, we can't believe that you are in front of a church. We knew how you were. We knew what you did. But today I can say, thank you God. You saved me. Let me tell you something. Never give up on your faith. In fact, make sure that you strengthen your faith every single day. Believe that all things are possible. Mark 9.23, it says, All things are possible to him that believes. God cannot manifest His glory if there's unbelief. We read about it in, remember Jesus when He seeds action. Faith precedes action. Matthew 9, 28, Jesus healed two blind people. He said to them, do you believe that I can do this? Jesus, Lord, they answered. Uh, yes, Lord, they, they answered. He touched their eyes and said, what you have believed will be done for you. Again, we see there was a belief before the action took place. There was a belief before God's glory could be manifest. There needs to be a belief before we can get the spiritual dead out from the tombs. Only through faith can we stand at the tombs of the spiritually dead and see them come to life. Maybe this morning you say to yourself, I have been praying for the salvation of my wife, of my husband, of my brother, of my sister, of my children, of my enemies, whoever. You have asked God to make them alive in Him. To give them everlasting life. To raise them from their spiritual grave. But in the back of your mind, you do not believe that it will ever happen. 
You do not believe that it will ever happen. God, that man will never come to Christ. Only when you truly believe will you see God's glory manifest. I want you to remember that. The belief must first come for you. I also need you to understand this this morning. The onus for the manifestation of God's glory lies with your ability and willingness to believe, not by God's actions. Remember that. If there is no belief, then we can stop what we are doing right now. If, we, if there's no belief, we can st stop being a church. Because we are supposed to reflect God's saving grace, God's glory to the world, to the spiritually dead. And if there's no belief, if we don't believe in what we are doing, how can we do it? It can only be achieved by faith. My question this morning to you is, do you truly believe? Do you truly believe? Our third scripture. We're going to read 39 and we're going to read 41. 39 says, Jesus said, take the stone away. And then in 41 it says, so the stone was moved away from the entrance of the tomb. Again, who was Jesus addressing there? The crowd. The people standing there, he said to them, you need to remove all the obstacles. That's another job you have. When we are dead, we are bound by sin. But Satan will also try to prevent us from leaving the tomb. He wants to keep us in the tomb. He places an obstacle or obstacles in front of you. Because he don't want you to leave. Because he knows if you leave there, it's finished. But we can have a lot of obstacles in our way. It can be your spouse, it can be your family, it can be your friends, it can be social circles, belief system, your free will, your pleasures, your job, your weekend activities, your sport, someone else's husband or wife. Did I just say that out loud? Your children, your addictions, your bad habits, false doctrine, and many, many, many more. There's a lot of things that stand between you and leaving that tomb. Satan knows which button to press. He knows what obstacle to place between you and Jesus Christ. What obstacle has he placed in front of you? What obstacle is currently between you and Jesus Christ, if any? We are called to remove the obstacles as well. In the scripture, it is very evident that this responsibility was not placed on the dead person to remove the, 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 the stone in front of the tomb. The responsibility was given to the people in front of that tomb. Jesus told the living to remove the stone in front of the tomb of the dead. We also read this in Isaiah. Isaiah 57, it says, It will be said, build a road, build a road, prepare the way. Listen to this, he says, remove every obstacle in the way of my people. That's our job, people. To remove obstacles in front of God's people. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we are so consumed sometimes by our own life that you don't care about other people. You don't have time for their problems. I don't have time for their obstacles. I've got my own problems. There are people in this congregation this morning that are crying out for someone to remove the obstacles in front of them. There are people out there that if the obstacle preventing them from coming to Jesus Christ will leap from that tomb and they will meet Jesus Christ. But it's our job to remove those obstacles for them. Or to at least give them a way to remove those obstacles. To tell them how to do it. To give them a way out. But because of our disobedience, because of our selfishness, they will have to remain behind those tombs and some, until somebody that's, that's listening to God's word will come there and he will remove those, that stone in front of that tomb and that man can come out. How did you remove the obstacles in front of your tomb? Because we've all been there. 
Bible says we were all dead in sin. Who removed your obstacles? Who helped you through those times? Shouldn't you do the same? Verse 43. And Jesus had said this. After Jesus had said this, he shouted as loudly as he could, Lazarus, come out. You need to understand that it is only Jesus that can call the dead to life. It is his power, his authority. Now a guy, I, wrote, I read a joke, that one guy he wrote there, he says, he's so glad that when Jesus stood in front of that tomb, he called Lazarus come forth. He says, because if he didn't use his name, all the dead people would have risen up. And we have had, would have had some problems there. He called him by name. He says, Lazarus, come out. And that's what he does with us as well. He stands at the tomb and he says, Kuebus, come out. Shal, come out. Dion, come out. Vili, come out. Stel, come out. He calls you by name. You know why? Because he knows your name. Incidentally, we're speaking about that next week. He knows your name. We cannot call anyone, in, anyone to life from our own power and our own authority. It needs to come from Jesus. He is the one that will do the calling. We only have to be His vessels. We are His vessels through which He calls people. It is only through Jesus that we can become alive. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. Jesus is life. We are not the life. Nothing else is the life. Only Jesus is the life, and He is the only one who can call anyone to be restored back to life. Unfortunately, people are, are following preachers. They're following doctrines. They're following different religions because they are looking for a way to come alive. And they think those people or that religion or that doctrine is the life-giving force that will get them from their tomb. But there's only one, and that's Jesus Christ. Nothing else will make you become alive but Jesus Christ. He already died for us on the cross at Calvary. That means He already called us. When He was on that cross, He called us to Him. He called us to come to Him. He called us in order for us to have a personal relationship with Him and with the Father. He called us to life. And He said in John 6, 53, He says, I can guarantee this truth. If you don't eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink this blood, you don't have the source of life in you. That has to do with the cross. If you do not believe that He died on the cross for your sin, you cannot have life. Yo, I'm preaching hard this morning. <laughs> you have to adhere to His call. It is a personal thing. Remember that. It is a personal thing. So far, we have seen that everything that happened was responsibility, was the responsibility of the crowd. Remember that. They had to understand that that person is dead because of the smell. They had to remove the obstacle. They had to believe. But now this has got nothing to do with the crowd now. This is a personal thing. This is to do with the guy that's lying there dead. He has to adhere to the call of Jesus Christ calling him from death. They need to understand that there is a measure of responsibility that lies on their shoulder. It is called obedience. Obedience is the call of the Lord. Come out. Become alive. Follow me. There can be all the faith in the world. All the obstacles can be removed. But if you don't take that initial step, if you don't stand up and hear to Jesus' voice calling you, then there's nothing anyone else can do. You won't be able to blame anyone the day you stand in front of the white throne of God and God asks you, why didn't you adhere to my call? There's nothing, no excuses. You can say, well, 
This is my excuse. No. And it's how I called you. It's your responsibility. Obedience is all I asked. If you are sitting here this morning and you know that you are spiritually dead, I want to encourage you to listen to Jesus' voice. He's calling you. Trust me. He's calling you by name. He wants you to become spiritually alive. Otherwise, He wouldn't have gone through that death on the cross, that painful death. He wants you to be alive. And He wants you to listen to His voice. Won't you listen this morning? Won't you take that first step to everlasting life in Jesus Christ in heaven? What is actually keeping you? And when you listen to His voice, there's a promise. Galatians 2, 13 to 15, it says, You were once dead because of your failures and your uncircumcised corrupt nature, but God made you alive with Christ when He forgave all your failures. All our sins are forgiven. He did this by erasing the charge, charges that were brought against us by the written law God has established. He took the charges away by nailing them on the cross. Your sins have been nailed to the cross. He stripped the rulers and authorities of their power and made a public spectacle of them as He celebrated His victory in Christ. Did you get how powerful this is? You were a sinner. He nailed it on that cross. All your sins It's forgiven. And because He did this, He made a spectacle of the rulers. Those people who, who goes out and... and, and ridicule you my sins is on the cross I don't care you are made alive and your sins are forgiven when Christ died on the cross every single sin every single sin is forgiven all you ever did wrong is forgiven that is powerful stuff that is God's promise this morning then we get to the last verse this morning verse 44 it says, the dead man came out. Strips of cloth were wound around his feet and hands, and his face was wrapped with a handkerchief. Jesus told them, free Lazarus and let him go. You need to loosen the hands and the feet. Even after we have been made alive, even after the obstacles keeping us in the tomb has been removed, there is still one thing that needs to be done. We need to get rid of the bur bur burial clothes. It is the burial clothes that prevent us from walking because our feet are wrapped. It is the burial clothes that keep us from working for the Lord because our hands are tied. It is the burial clothes that keeps us from spreading the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, because we've got a handkerchief wrapped around our face. Jesus told the people standing there to free Lazarus. Again, it was an instruction to the crowd, to the living just imagine if they also still had their burial clothes on. They were alive, but they were bound in burial clothes. How can you free somebody if you are still bound in your burial clothes? You cannot do that. How would they be able to free others if they were also bound? How are they to see what to do if their faces were still covered? Many people were made alive in Christ, but they are still wearing the burial clothes. They have not gotten rid of that which prevents them from doing God's work. They are bound and not completely free. Some people are still bound by past sins. And we've just read what he said. He nailed all your sins on the cross. But some people are still bound by, by past sins. They can't believe that they will ever be good enough for God or to do God's work because of what they have done in, as sinners. Uh, they cannot believe that God can really forgive all of their sins. How can God look upon me? I've done these terrible things. Let me tell you something. You are no longer a sinner. You are a free man and you are a free woman. A new creation. You are forgiven. Some people are bound by their own limitations. I cannot speak to other people. I am too shy. I stutter. I do not know enough of the Bible. I am an introvert. I am not comfortable with speaking in front of others. 
Did you see this? I, 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 I again. When we are going to break free from those burial clothes, take the leap of faith and say, I am able to do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens me. It is not from yourself, it is through Jesus Christ that you are doing these things. When Jesus is in you, the Holy Spirit will lead you and He will, uh, and He will, and He should take over. You do not have to be shy anymore. You do not have to worry about stuttering. Moses tried that trick. Jesus said to him, go to the Pharaoh, go speak to him. He said, Lord, I'm stuttering. He said, I don't care, go. Go. I will give somebody to speak on your behalf, but go. That's all God asks of us. Just go. Your limitations is not limitations when Jesus Christ is in your life. You don't have to worry about speaking to others because it should not be you speaking in the first place. It should be the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Make space for the Holy Spirit. If you do not make space for the Holy Spirit, how are you going to let the Holy Spirit talk through you, speak through you? You cannot do it. For once, take a step back and allow Him to do what He does through you. Many times we are the obstacle preventing the Holy Spirit to work. I want to repeat this again. Many times we are the obstacle preventing the Holy Spirit to work. Welcome, Henry. I missed you. Some people are worried what others will say or think about them. Why do you worry what others will think of you? Worry what God thinks of you. Those who have something bad to say about you or who mocks you are actually the people who are dead. Those are actually the people who need to hear your voice, who need to hear you speak. When they mock you, say, Amen, I've seen the dead. Jesus came for the spiritually dead. When you keep quiet, you are bound by fear. And we did not receive a spirit of fear. We are needed to loosen the burial clothes of those who have been raised from the dead. But if we ourselves are bound, how can we ever think of accomplishing that? There are some of us sitting here this morning that will have to admit that they are still bound. I don't know what is binding you. I do not know. You know. You cannot stand firm if your feet are tied. When, Jesus, when, when Paul wrote about the armor of God, he said, Stand then firm. Have you read that? How can you stand firm if you are bound? You are going to be pushed over like this without a problem. You cannot stand firm if you are bound by the burial clothes. What is it that binds you? What is it that keeps you from doing what God has called you to do? I want you guys to stand up this morning. I want you to stand up. And I want you to close your eyes. Quibus, play that song for me in the background, please. I want you to close your eyes this morning. If there is anything that binds you,